Amen from God's people. Yeah. Father, we thank you once again. Thank you for your love. And thank you because you picked us up from the depth of sin. You brought us to the platform of salvation. And now you have given us a ministry to go out and tell other people the message we ought to give to them. Make it clear. Make it plain in every heart in Jesus' name. And we pray we will not be lukewarm. We will not be lethargic. We will not be idle. We pray that your fire will burn in every heart, propel us and send us forth with passion to rescue the perishing in Jesus' name. Give us the appropriate word for every person we meet. That conviction will come to them. They will ask, what must I do to be saved? And you put your word in our mouth, will lead them to Calvary, to the cross of Christ. They will be saved. And you'll keep them saved by your grace in Jesus' name. Once again, speak to your servants, for your servants are hearing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Welcome to chapter 2 of Romans. As we now look at how Paul the Apostle continued speaking to the whole of humanity. He has spoken to the Gentiles. Now he wants to talk to the Jews. The Jews considered themselves better than the Gentiles. They thought they were holier than the Gentiles. They proclaimed themselves to be more acceptable to God than the Gentiles in their own sight. They were more righteous and more enlightened than the Gentiles. Therefore, they condemned the Gentiles. They rejoiced in greater privileges. They thought that God would judge the heathen more severely than themselves. They thought if they did anything bad, the Lord would be leaning to them. They were the covenant people of God. That's what they thought. They were the descendants of Abraham. That's how they thought. They thought he might judge the sinners outside, but those of us inside, it's not going to be that severe. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, but wherein thou judgest another, Jews judging Gentiles, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Here Paul the Apostle affirmed that they were inexcusable. Whosoever knows enough to condemn any sin in others is without excuse. If he himself commits similar sins. In this chapter, the apostle shows the impartiality of God. To the Jew and to the Gentiles, God is impartial. To the high and to the low, God is impartial. To the king and to the subjects, God is impartial. To the pastor and to the member of the church, God is impartial to the parents and to the children. God is impartial to the officer and to the common man. God is impartial. God's judgment is impartial. God's judgment will always be impartial. God's judgment will forever be impartial. The impartiality of God, the righteous judge. The impartiality of God, the righteous judge. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. 
But thou that judgest doest the same things. But we're sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth. He doesn't have one standard for the Jews and another standard for the Gentiles. He does not have one standard for the leaders and then another standard for the followers. He does not have one standard for the people that are pursuing those who are wrong. And then another standard for those who are actually wrong. Because we're sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth. According to truth, it gives them, all of them, that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them, we do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, the impartiality of God, the righteous judge. We're going to look at verses 1 through to 16. And in verses 1 to 16, we're divided into three parts. Number one, the inexcusable man before the great judge. The inexcusable man before the great judge. Point number two. The implication for mankind under God's judgment. The implication for mankind under God's judgment. Number three is impartiality towards all men as the guilty are judged. The guilty will be judged. And we learn about his impartiality towards all men as the guilty when the guilty will be judged. Number one, the inexcusable man before the great judge. We'll come back to Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Again, remember, he had already brought the Gentiles under condemnation. And he had assured the Gentiles that judgment was coming. And the Jews were saying, that's right, tell them. Judgment is coming. That's right. Tell them the Gentiles will perish. That's right. Tell them that those abominable Gentiles, they go going to face the wrath of God and they forgot about themselves. That's why I said, therefore, therefore, therefore thou art inexcusable. O man, whosoever thou art, a Jew, whosoever thou art, that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. Look at that word, inexcusable. Inexcusable. Judgment will be, number one, impartial. Number two, inescapable. The people that go on in sin and sin, they keep on sinning, and they think the judgment day will never come. Recording day will come. It's inescapable. Number three, it's imminent. As we look at the signs of the times, we know it is imminent. Number four, it is illustrative. It's happened to others. It's an illustration. It's also going to happen to the people to follow the same pathway. We we'll see it from the time of Genesis through to the time of Malachi. And Jesus mentioned the people that the top of Siloam fell. And he said, do you think they are more guilty than you are? Except you repent, you also shall likewise perish. It's illustrative. The judgment number, number five is informative. Informative. The Lord is giving us information. It's like we're lining up. Humanity is lining up. And as humanity lines up, it's happened to the one in front, to the one in front, to the one in front. And it's informative, it's informing you that huh, it's coming. Number six, it's incomparable. Incomparable to anything you've seen. Incomparable to anything you have gone through. Incomparable to what suffering sorrow you have had. Number seven, interminable. Interminable. Never ending. Impartial. Inescapable, imminent, illustrative, 
informative, incomparable, interminable. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art. Think about this. Everyone is a judge. Citizens judge the leaders. The leaders judge the citizens. Everyone is a judge. Mothers judge their daughters. Why are you doing that? Why are you going that way? What's that person your friend? Who are you moving with? If I see you do that again, mothers judge daughters. Daughters cannot talk, but may not talk, but daughters judge mothers. Fathers judge children. Children judge fathers. Teachers judge students. Ministers, preachers, pastors judge discipline members. Members are not totally ignorant. Members judge ministers. The stubborn judge the stiff neck. And the stiff neck are judging the stubborn people. Backsliders judge reprobates. You're going too far. You're going too far. You're going too far. How about you? The righteous judge the unholy. And yet, every judge will be judged. That's why he tells us, therefore, Jew, thou art inexcusable. Gentile, thou art inexcusable. Pastor, thou art inexcusable. Member, thou art inexcusable. The judge at the, in the court, thou art inexcusable. Leaders, political leaders, thou art inexcusable. And those who pursue others that are caught in corruption, thou art inexcusable. Corrupt man, thou art inexcusable. Citizen, thou art inexcusable. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure, but this we know for a certainty, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, O man, and thinkest thou, O woman, and thinkest thou, O judge, and thinkest thou, O pastor, and thinkest thou, O woman leader, and thinkest thou, O mother, and thinkest thou, O husband, and thinkest thou, O wife, and thinkest thou, O man, that judgest them, that do such things, and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It's telling us that people who are quick to judge, they demand righteousness from other people. They themselves are not righteous. They demand a high standard from other people. They themselves do not maintain any standard. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 38, Genesis chapter 38. We're reading here from verse 24. Something that happened to a woman. And then eventually the father in law heard of what had happened. And the father in law brought judgment immediately. But look at this. He himself was not clean. Genesis chapter 38, verse 24. And it came to pass, about three months after, that it was told Judah, say, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law has played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child, pregnant by order. And Judah said, bring her forth, 
and let her be born. This is Genesis. And there are people that think that there was no law in Genesis. But we're going to find, if you go through Genesis, that evil was condemned. Why did God bring the flood? Because of their evil as judgment. And when she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I of charge? And she said, Before you born me alive, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet, the bracelet, and the star. And Jacob acknowledged them. Actually, Jacob was responsible. Tamar had sat by the roadside, but she covered herself. And Jacob thought she was a loose woman, available for any passerby. And so he asked her, can I come? And she said, yes. And so she became pregnant through Jacob, the father-in-law, because the husband had died. And uh, she was to be given to the next boy, the next child of Jacob, and it wasn't done. And so she played that on him. And when Jacob heard that she had committed um, immorality and now she was pregnant, she judged immediately. How people judge so quickly. And, J and Judah, sorry, it's Judah, not Jacob. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more. She judged, but look at that kind of judgment. How many pastors, disciplined members of the church? And if you investigate very well and you go behind the screen, the one that is disciplining other people is not free himself. But he thinks, I'm the pastor, I'm the leader, I have to judge, I have to maintain discipline in the church. Yes, you have to, but are you qualified? In Second Samuel chapter 12, Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 5, And David's anger was greatly kindled, against the man and said to Nathan as the Lord liveth look at David mention the name of God as the God as the Lord liveth the man that has done this shall surely die and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did the sin and because he had no pity and Nathan said unto David thou art the man judging and yet guilty of that same crime john chapter 8 in john chapter 8 here comes or here come the jews they're taking a woman in an improper situation and now they came to jesus and he said, here we are, John chapter 8, verse 2. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taking in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? You think that these people were saved people, sanctified people, holy people, righteous people? Are you there? You know that this one is wrong. You always point, that's not standard. That's not proper. That's not the right thing to do. That man calls himself a pastor. Look at him. That sister calls herself a woman leader. Look at her. Look at the charge of 
pastor so and so. Look at the daughter of overseer so and so. And you'll think all the people that are pointing out uh, these things, they themselves, they have gone to Calvary. They have gone to the cross. And you'll think that they have taken care of their own eternal destiny. Not really. And so Jesus did not answer them. Verse 7. So, when they continued asking, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin, among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stood down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. Can you imagine? Not one of them justified. Not one of them saved. You know, sometimes you think that people actually want holiness and righteousness. And you might get a letter from A and B and C and D and F and G, six of them. And then they say, this person is not keeping the standard. This person is not keeping the standard. Good letter and good report. And good desire. Let's keep the standard. But the people who are doing that, before you judge other people, are you ready for heaven? Do you have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? There are times the husband will make the home a hell for the wife. On minor things, inconsequential things, insignificant things, something you know, any mature man, husband, will overlook. New life, a new approach to family life. But it's always hammering on this thing we should overlook and forget. And makes the home a hell for everybody. And yet when you go, you don't even have to go in depth. The man himself is not as clean, is not as pure. People are only thinking about immorality. They are only thinking about adultery, fornication. We're not talking about that. There are a lot of things that men do. You starve the woman. You hold back from the woman. The money that you'll be giving, you don't give. And the wickedness and the cruelty, creating a famine, a local famine in the family. And everybody is coming to have ulcer in the family. All that is there, terrible things in the family. I will have money on this, I have money on this. Thou that judgest. All these people went away one by one. And it says, even to the very last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. Jesus answered, Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Was he justifying sin? No. The forgiving sin. Was he approving of the sin? No. He was cleansing her, setting her free, giving her grace. That's why he came. He did not come to condemn. He did not come to kill, to destroy. He came to save. Neither do I condemn thee. Here is grace. And go and sin no more. He'll do it for us in Jesus' name. Good amen from there. Amen. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. An instructor, thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest not thou thyself? 
that the preachers, a man should not steal. Does thou steal? Thou that says a man should not commit adultery. Does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols. Does thou commit sacrilege? That that makest thy boast of the law. Through the breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God. If we continue like that, we're not excusable. Because judgment will come. Point number two. The implication for mankind under God's judgment. The implication. We're reading from chapter 2, verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, they'll have eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There'll be indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. Here Paul the Apostle is, is beginning to bring out his point. The Jews were thinking judgment, don't talk about that, were children of Abraham. Judgment, don't talk about that. If you're talking about darkness, look at the Gentile. You're talking about idolatry, look at the Gentile. You're talking about having all that gods, look at the Gentiles. You're talking about immorality in their temples, look at the Gentiles. You're talking about sacrilege, look at the Gentiles. As for us Jews, well, it's not that we're perfect. We who are Jews, but as we the guilt and the condemnation of those Gentiles against our own iniquity. Ours is negligible. That's why it says in that verse 9, there will be tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Those say uh, Jews never thought salvation would ever come to the Gentiles. But they didn't they didn't notice the words of Jesus Christ. He told them, He told them that the Gentiles will come in into the kingdom. Matthew chapter eight. In Matthew chapter 8, reading from verse 11, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Gentiles, Gentiles will be saved. And then he says, But the children of the kingdom, shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He told them that there will be judgment against all unrighteousness of man, of the Jew, and there will be appreciation and justification for the Gentiles that have their faith, not in themselves, but in the Savior in the Lord, they will be saved. He told them in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Reading from verse 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, when she are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God 
and you yourselves thrust out. And it shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. If they were listening, they should have heard. They were not listening, they didn't hear. God does not overlook the sin of the enlightened while he punishes the ignorant severely. The Jews were enlightened. The Gentiles were, many of them, ignorant. God does not overlook the sin and the condemnation of church leaders who claim immunity while he judges the iniquity and the sin of the ordinary members of the church. You understand that the constitution of the country is not the Bible. The Bible is different. The constitution grants immunity to some officers who are sitting on the seat of authority. And so they, because they know that immunity is there, they can do this and this and this and that. The leaders of the people. And the people will do similar things even less than those in authority are doing. And those members, those subjects, those citizens will be judged severely. Then it comes to the man on the seat of authority and he'll point to the constitution. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. I have immunity. And there are preachers, bishops, pastors, overseers that take from the constitution of the world and they impose it on the Bible. They do this, challenge them. Hey, shut up. I'm the pastor. And they go this direction. Don't touch the anointed of the Lord. I have immunity. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because the same judgment, in fact, severe judgment will come on those who know the truth. And they are even effecting the truth. And they are punishing, they are disciplining the people that do what they shouldn't do. And yet they themselves are doing worse things. Pastor, let me ask you. And you sweep under the carpet. And you say, I prayed about that. If you heard that a worker in your church did exactly that thing, what will you do? What have you done? And how do you react and relate to those members in the church, workers in the church, leaders, pastors in the church, or their leadership? And they have done something, and they know you to be a firm overseer, a firm superintendent, a firm leader, because we must keep the standard in the church. I agree with you, we must, we must, we have to. But let charity begin at home. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And that servant, which knew the is Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. You know, in the kingdom of God, the people who know the truth, they will be judged more severely than those who are ignorant. And then it says in verse 48, But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, it says, of him shall much be required. Isn't that different from the world? In the world, immunity for the leaders. In the church, severity for those leaders. 
and to whom men have committed much of him they shall ask the more the lord is telling us that there is um, judgment for those who do evil saints who have grace are not spared when sinners who do not have grace are punished think about this there is a child that has gone to school has got the best of teachers the best of books the best of instruction the best of provision and yet he failed another child went to school and the school is gone to it's a poor school they don't teach well there they don't have laboratory they don't have good teachers they don't have good records of uh, educating children and these two children belong to the same father one fortunate one sent to a very good school he failed the other one also failed but he didn't have good teachers good books or anything and then the father of those two children he punishes the one that went to the poor school severely and then he excused or just punished in a very little way you know how much i love you why did you do so badly just lightly that will not be right god is the creator of everyone is giving us christ is giving us the bible is giving us grace is giving us strength is giving us position is giving us authority is giving us the holy ghost and with all the provisions and privileges he has given us we go back into sin we do evil we offend him we're abominable and then the gentiles they've never had this doctrine the doctrine of grace there's no hell they don't have any living indwelling spirit that will help them and remind them of anything and they do badly the one that has the bible the grace the strength the christ the salvation and the opportunity and the congress uh, the congress teaching everything that does badly will be judged more severely the other one will be judged but less severely christ does not give his followers license to go on sinning christ gives power to go and sin no more he forgives yes he forgives past sins he does not forgive future sins before the sins are committed what kind of government are you going to have if the government forgives future sins of its citizens you cannot expect them to build a good nation a king comes and he forgets himself a president comes and he forgets himself and is making an end of the year address and he says my fellow citizens i want to tell you i love you so much and the love i have for you makes me to declare that all those who have done anything wrong in the prison today tonight after this nationwide address they are released not only that all the crime you may commit from now till the end of this year you have not committed them yet i just want to show you how much i love you i forgive you ahead of time there will be anarchy there will be violence there will be destruction that nation will be ruined god does not have a government like that that you will say go ahead i have forgiven your past sins i forgive your present sins i forgive your future sins you have a license do as you please the kingdom of god will be worse than the kingdom of the world god cannot do that god is the most righteous judge he judges he judges sin he judges sin in the sanctuary he judges sin outside the sanctuary first peter chapter 4 
First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that will be not the gospel of God? The implication for mankind on the God's judgment. Point number three is impartiality towards all men as the guilty are judged. We're coming to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, we're reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without law shall perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they don't have the law of Moses, they don't have the ceremonial law, they don't have the law in the old covenant, and yet they do by nature the things contained in the law. These have been not the law. Moses are a law unto themselves. They know what's appropriate. They know what's acceptable. And they call on the God of heaven. And they say, those who say, we want to know you. We want to be saved. We are not satisfied with what we have. Lord, help us. We know that this is the standard of the law. But we are breaking that law. Help us. A man like that, Cornelius, he was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. And yet, he was praying to God. He knew that something was missing. He wanted to please God. The law of God was reaching in his heart and was pursuing and pursuing and pursuing. An angel appeared to him and said, You want something more than you've got? Yes. Say to Peter, He will come and lead you in the way of truth. Immediately, a gentle. He said for Peter. And then Peter came. He had collected together all his household. And he said, we're all here to hear whatever the Lord will tell us through you. And that is the attitude of those Gentiles that actually wanted the salvation of the Lord. And it says in verse 15, which showed those Gentiles the work of the Lord reaching in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, excusing them, accusing them, or else accusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. You want to understand that the Gentiles could not claim immunity from the judgment of God because we are Gentiles, we are not Jews, we don't have the law, we don't have any standard, and God has not favored us to give us what he gave to the descendants of Abraham. Because of that, we are all right. No, they were not all right. You know, there are people that say, well, we know that our lives are not perfect, but you know, we're not in deeper life where they teach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And it goes through all those verses. Number one, if you know that that deeper life is teaching Bible thoroughly, and you know where you are, they are not teaching thoroughly. Why are you there? Are you tied down there? 
you love darkness rather than light. That's why you know the place, the truth is being preached, and you cannot go there. But all the same, even if you remain there, the Lord is not going to excuse you and say, I know it's not your fault, your pastor didn't teach you. And because you didn't have what these other people have, I excuse you. No, there's impartiality. Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. Listen to this. For in all these the nations defiled are defiled, which I cast out before you. The nations are defiled. They don't have the law of Moses. They didn't have the law of Moses. I cast them out. And the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomites out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. And shall not commit any of these abominations. Neither any of your own nation or any stranger that sojourneth among you. Look at verse 27. For all these abominations have the men of the land done. Not Israelites, not Jews, Gentiles, which were before you. And the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also. When ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that are before you. Those nations that were before them, they couldn't say, oh, you know, we don't have the law, therefore we can be lawless. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Ignorance is no excuse. We have the whole Bible now. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward, nor taketh reward. He doth execute judgment. Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're reading from verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, let, let's, back to, let's back up to verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to deal after the abominations of those nations. These there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that chooseth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, is saying, Jews, descendants of Abraham, you must not do these things. But the Gentiles are doing them. Yes. Look at what happened to those Gentiles. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because, look at that, and because, talking about the Gentile nations, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does dry them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect of the Lord thy God. Human courts of law often show preference to the wealthy, not God. Human courts of law often show preference for the individual, to the, to the influential, and to the well connected, but not God. God cannot be bribed, and God cannot look favorably at evil just because that man, that woman is well connected. And you know, 
the people who have wealth, influence, connection, and position in this world. They, they think that as the government, as the judgment of the world is, so is the judgment of God. And they go on with impunity. They do whatever they want to do. They know there's a God in heaven, but they are thinking, uh, at my position, with my authority, God knows that in my position, I have to do this and do this and do that. Because I am such and such. I have such and such. They think as God is going to act, is going to act like men. They will excuse them as human beings excuse them. Not so. God is absolutely impartial. There will be no consideration of race, no consideration of status, no consideration of gender, no consideration of social standing, no consideration of denominational connection, no consideration of ecclesiastical position. Will ever influence him, he will not consider them. All who die in sin are forever lost, whoever. Those people may be. And whatever people might think of them, whatever songs might be sung concerning them, and whatever history books may write about them, and whatever church ceremony might take place after their death, all who die in besetting sin, all who die in private secret sin, all who die in abominable iniquity, even though people may not know, but God knows, all who die in sin are forever lost. God's abundant grace is available today. And if we're going to escape the judgment of God, now is the time. And now is to check our records and check our hearts. How do I stand? How do you stand? Judas is carried hurt. All the message, all the messages that John, the beloved, heard. It's not what you hear. It's what you do with what you have heard. He heard about those who received the grace of God, the pardon of God. And the Lord spoke directly to him. You are planning to do something. Don't do that. It was better such a person were not born. He was one of the disciples counted among them. He went on and on. He died in sin. All who die in sin will be forever lost. But the mercy of God is still there today. And we can ask him for strength, for grace, for divine help, for upholding power, for sustainable salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Let's back up to verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. All excuses gone. All supposition of immunity gone. All assumption that God will be more lenient with me because I'm enlightened, because of my position. More than the other people that don't have the privileges I have. All that gone. So we don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold now. Is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In a word, in a minute, we can hold on to the Christ of Calvary. He'll forgive, He'll set us free. 
in a single prayer we can look at the blood of jesus dripping from calvary it will cleanse us and make us whole in a moment we can look at the substitutionary work and sacrifice of christ and then he'll cancel every bad sin, every evil sin, hidden or public that we have done. And he'll say, today you have your name in the book of life. Look at that thief on the cross of Calvary. Compare him with Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot went through three and a half years of teaching of training. Judas Iscariot was part of the special group, 12 of them. Judas Iscariot could make a record of all the miracles Christ performed. Judas Iscariot carried the bag. Judas Iscariot sat the same table with the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas Iscariot ate from the same plate that Jesus held. And Judas comes to receive the muscle directly from Jesus' hand into his mouth. Judas has just received the warning that danger was ahead. Judas has just saw the people that Jesus forgave. Judas has just urged the promise for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. With all those advantages, he sinned, he died, he went to hell. Here is another man. He didn't have the privilege of listening to all those messages, not even the privilege of water baptism, not the privilege of the Lord's Supper. Not the privilege of hearing the words of Jesus. But here on the cross, about to die, Lord, this is my last chance. Remember me when you come to your kingdom. In the agony of Jesus Christ on the cross, he said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. He got to heaven. Before Peter, before John, he got to heaven, before Stephen, he had the benefit of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the thief on the cross. No water baptism, no chance to even go and live out the life, no chance to do evangelism, no chance to do anything. He died there and went to heaven. Our officer, Judas died, went to the other side. You have a choice to make. Make your choice. I pray we'll be in heaven together. Rise up and let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord, it's the day of mercy, the day of grace. The day of the goodness of God. Stop judging. Stop pointing accusing finger. And stop being so severe on other people. Watch over yourself. 